Let me get this started. Welcome everyone to the Cash Rules Podcast. My name is Keith Smith and I'm here with my co-host. He's the head of research and the educational program development specialist, please. Fabian Rodan, welcome y'all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we are here with our special guest. Jordan What's going Blumen. on, Jordan? Hey. <laughs> Thanks for joining, man. So I want to start off just by making sure that we are all aware that none of what we are discussing today should be taken as legal, financial, and or tax advice. Instead, the objective of our conversation today is to highlight some of the unspoken rules in finance and to discuss why these concepts so often go unspoken and what we can be doing on a practical level to change that reality in an informational educational capacity. So with that said, Fabian, how you doing today, man? Oh, great, man. Oh, it's wonderful to be alive. As my grandmother say, when you see the sun, just be happy, brother. Just be happy. And I am, man. It's beautiful outside. How you doing, Keith? I am incredible. <laughs> uh, I love I tell it. people to call me the Hulk. Yeah, yeah. You gotta, gotta feel that green, baby. That's what we're talking about here. That's financial literacy at its best. Yes, and sir. without further ado, I, I love to welcome, you know, he's a leader in digital strategy. He's a, a financial literacy component in terms of education. You know, he's definitely down with that soda energy. I just, I'm looking through his his um, Indeed page. I'm telling you, his his resume is long. All uh, the information he's going to share with us, all everybody, um, it's going to be great. Please utilize it, abuse it, um, and welcome the one and only Jordan Bloomingdale. Welcome. How you doing, brother? Doing great, man. Doing fantastic. It's like you said, it's beautiful outside. So glad to be here for the day. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yes, sir. So, so yeah, Jordan. We know that today. I think one of the main focuses of this top, of the conversation today will be around credit, right? So. With that already in place, just tell us, please, a little bit about yourself, where you're based, some of your, you know, a brief history and like what you're doing right now on a daily basis. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. So um, I come from a really small town uh, in North Georgia. Um, you know, I, I had a, a decent upbringing, um, smart parents, whatnot, um, went through public school, uh, went out and got a degree. Um, and learned a lot along the way, but one of the things that I didn't learn through school and even through business school, uh, when I was getting my business degree was actually financial literacy. And if you stop and think about that for a second, the irony is not unlost. Um, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that you don't think about it until it's too late until you fall into a pit. Um, and so when I came across, um, the, this knowledge, I was like, I want to make sure I am able to get this knowledge into as many hands as possible before it becomes too late for them. And so one of the things that I'm doing these days is not only helping people online through applications such as yourself. So I'm very, very grateful for y'all for doing this, um, but also being able to provide this knowledge, um, offline in an offline capacity in my local community and as you know as much as possible uh offline as well so very cool very cool yeah man and you have a pretty cool story so we're, we're gonna get deep into it later but first off like i just want to make sure we start hitting the bat with some questions so tell us like what is money to you to me money is nothing more than a tool it's nothing more than helping you get where you are to where you want to be. Um, it doesn't matter if you have $1 to your name or if you have a million dollars to your name. It's essentially a tool that you can use. And if you know how to use it properly, then you're going to be able to scale it to where whatever you're wanting to do and whatever goals you're wanting to have, um, it will help you to get there. And so to follow up on that, you know, and please feel free to give us some context around like how you started learning about this. What is credit to you? So that is a, another tool, um, but it's, it's, it's another tool, but it's not the same tool. So I had to learn this the hard way. 
Um, you know, going through college, uh, I did have a side job um, whenever I was taking classes and whatnot, but I was depending on credit almost as um, another form of money, which is, it's, it's not, it's in replacement of money. And so if you look at it as a replacement to money, rather than in addition to money, then it starts to change that mindset, right? So I was using credit for things like, um, things like rent, things like going out to eat and this, that, and the other. But then I was also using my paycheck for those same exact purposes. And it's not duplicating, it's replacing. And so when you look at credit as um, essentially another tool and a replacement to money, then, um, you know, it, it starts to change the narrative a little bit. That's such an interesting concept you, you just brought up in terms of just a replacement, not even something different. It's just a substitute. Um, and that's very interesting. Um, what are some of the negative mindsets around credit that you have countered? And would you encourage those with such mindsets to reconsider? Man, I, I think we could have a whole nother conversation just on the <laughs> topic alone. Um, I have heard it all from, you know, credit, credit's no good. Um, you don't need credit. Um, I've heard that, you know, cash is king. You, you can live your life on, on cash alone. Um, I've heard that, you know, uh, all forms of debt as it pertains to credit is bad, um, which is one of the biggest myths out there. Um, I've heard it all. But one of the things that I would I would challenge people to think about is when you when you look at credit, if you don't know how to use a line of credit that is worth a hundred dollars, you're not going to be able to know how to use a line of credit that's worth a hundred thousand mm. dollars. But it's the same principle. It's the exact same principle. If you use, um, essentially, if you look at a basic utilization rule of thirty percent, if you use thirty percent of a line of credit, you'll always be able to have control of that no matter if it's a hundred dollars or a hundred thousand. So let me ask Love you this. I, I just wanted to take a step back because you said something and I just mm -hmm. want to make sure viewers understand. What do you mean by all forms, the four forms of depth? What do you mean by that statement you made? What do I mean by all the forms four, of depth? Yeah. What are the four, what are, is there a limit or, or what is the, what are some concepts of depth that you're referring to? Okay. So you have, there's a number of different, types of debt. You've got debt that is essentially quote unquote bad. Um, and there's a number of different gurus and teachers that will tell you one way or the other. But just from my personal understanding, my personal experience, you've got bad debt and you've got good debt. Bad debt is when you have taken on a purchase, you've consumed something, whether it be a service, a product, um, and you're not getting anything out of it other than just the fact that you traded money for something. Okay. So that could be, um, believe it or not, that could be a house. If your house is not making you any additional income, that could be a car. If you're not making any, if your car is depreciating and you're just using it for consumption, then it's considered bad debt. You're, you're constantly having to throw more money into it. Um, things like a, a fancy television could be considered bad debt. Um, uh, even student loan debt, if you're not using your degree to its fullest potential, could be considered bad debt. But on, on the other side, good debt could be a rental property. It could be going out and buying an ATM machine. It could be, um, you know, even, even things like these cell phones. If you have a cell phone and it's making you money, it could be considered good debt, even if you still, if you financed it is what I mean. Um, so different lines of credit, different types of loans uh, could be considered either good debt, good debt or bad debt. So, so I want to follow up on this just to 
drill in something that I think is super important that you brought up in two different things. So the first thing is around, so the difference between that debt, right? That's going into something that's going down in value Mm -hmm. and then using debt for something that's going to go up in value or that's going to be producing income for you. That amazingly said, well said. And then I want to back up a little bit too, because you talked about this concept of using a percentage, right? To think about uh, the way that you're, you're looking at credit. And I think that is so vital to changing the mindset around wealth building in, in general, right? Because um, and I've had countless conversations with people, even people who are wildly financially successful around like why that next number does not matter. Like in, as far as the units of dollars, like that means nothing. And what I like to say is this, like, if you're going to go and have a conversation with Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger, and you start talking to them about even millions of dollars, like that is not going to get their attention. Even billions, like is not going to get their attention. But when you come to someone like Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger or Ray Dalio, and you start talking to them about 20%, 30%, that is going to wake their brain up because once you start getting, once you scale, right, no matter how far you're going, the higher you go, the less each unit really means to you. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So just wanted to drill that home and then, and then to back up and say, you know, tell us a little bit more about like your experiences with that in your personal life as well. Yeah, it's, um, it's been a roller coaster, but it's been one where, you know, each stop has taught me something a little different. Um, so, you know, going back to when I first started learning about, you know, what I was doing wrong and what I, and trying to figure out what I didn't know that I didn't know, um, was really whenever I got that first check, you know, and I got the, the first bill in the mail after graduating college. And they said, well, you know, $500, January 1st is, is come and due. And I was like, well, wait a minute. What, what do you mean? You know, uh, well, you signed on this dotted line and, and six months has gone by your grace period's gone by and, and uh, now it's due. And those three little letters, D U E, um, you know, that, that can be a powerful word. So yeah. whenever I, um, you know, whenever I graduated, I was one of the ones that was fortunate in my class to actually get an internship, a paid internship at that. And I was making decent money um, for someone fresh out of college at the time. But, you know, I, I had a car payment, I had rent to pay, I had groceries to buy. And suddenly that, that paycheck started dwindling and started dwindling and started dwindling. And I'm like, well, you know, maybe I, I wanted to go out on a Friday night or I wanted to go, you know, out to eat. And, you know, I wanted to live, live the luxuries. And so what, what I couldn't do with my, um, what I couldn't do with my paycheck, I started doing with my credit cards. And after a couple of months, those credit card bills came due. And when I couldn't pay them, and after a few cycles of that, and that's a whole nother topic around cycles and around credit cards. But when I couldn't pay them, <laughs> they turned over to collections. And suddenly my credit started taking a nosedive. And then I couldn't get approved for more credit cards because I was trying to, you know, build, I was trying to climb that mountain faster than I could build it, essentially. Well, that brings up a good question, right? How does one get started building credit? That's, that is a good question. Um, so there's a couple of different tools uh, out there that I, that I personally recommend. One of them is a secured card. It's, it's a credit card that you put down a deposit on um, that you're, that's, you're not required to have any credit history or any kind of credit rating. And so you could start with a zero and you would be approved because you're putting down a deposit, but most people think of a deposit as a sacrifice, but what a deposit is in the form of a secured card is your foundation, okay? And there's a couple of secured cards out there that will say, well, you, you have to lay down that card, uh, that, that um, 
you have to lay down that deposit and then it's gone. But there's a few of them out there that are actually utilizing it as an incentive, as a carrot, because once you go through and you start building that discipline, then they actually give you that deposit back and you convert that secured line of credit to an unsecured line of credit. And then it becomes a traditional. That's the first um, type of credit. So that's what, what we call a revolving line of credit. An mm -hmm. installment law, line of credit, which is like a mortgage, a car note, per, personal note, stu uh, student loan, those can be built using something. Um, and I don't, I'm not affiliated with them at all. It's just one of the tools that I've used is called self. And essentially what it is, is banks do it sometimes, but this program that, I, that I've offered to a few of my clients um, is called self. And what it is, is, is it's a CD backed loan. So when you sign up, you sign up for a certain amount of money that you can pay each month into this CD. And once that CD comes to term, you actually get that money back but it's applied to a loan. And so that loan is reported to the credit bureaus every 30 days until it's paid off. Now, the downside to an installment loan is once it's paid off, that account is marked as closed. So you have mm. to have, it's a, it's a teeter-totter. You know, you remember the old, um, the old playgrounds that had the Yeah, the seesaws. Yeah, the seesaws. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's a balancing act between revolving loans and installment loans. And one is continually propping up the other. And as you do that, your credit gets older and older and your score goes up and up. And how does one prevent getting into a bad situation? Like, you know, with credit. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I would say at the very lowest common denominator is just taking a look at what your budget is and living at the very most within, if not below your means. Mm -hmm. So if you have goals, you want to live as low below your means, meaning how much income you're bringing in as you possibly can. Now, I'm not saying, you know, for the rest of your life, go out there and live on ramen and water for, you know, forever. But if you have to make that sacrifice for a season in order to accomplish that goal, then having that goal, that why is is going to be your driver. Um, additionally, just making sure that, you know, if you take out a line of credit, whether it be a revolving line of credit or an installment loan, knowing when those payments are due and paying as far forward as you possibly can. So if it's say due on the 19th, maybe consider setting a reminder and paying on the 10th, you know, a, a five to seven days, 10 days before that, so that nothing, you know, we all know life happens. Things get in the way, people forget stuff, things come up, life happens. But if you set those checks and balances into place, you're going to be less likely to fall into, you know, um, something that's going to get you in trouble. No, you're right there. And let's take let's take this scenario. You've hit rock bottom. You know, how does one rebuild credit when it's too late? Like they got close to that zero score or, or, <laughs> or you know, those dreaded five and four or four hundreds. Um, how does one rebuild it from there? What are some tips you can provide? That's uh, that's where I started when I first when I first realized that credit mattered. I had a 480 credit score, mm. and now I've still got some ways to go. I'm still building, but I have that knowledge. I have that foundation. Um, and so what I would say is, if you have already fallen in the pit hole pitfalls, if you've already made the mistakes, just know that the foundation, the knowledge, the education is, is your starting point. Once you have that and you know what to do, then you won't fall into the same mistakes again. And at that point, you can start recovering. You can start rebuilding by removing negative items like derogatory marks. You can start working with creditors where you can to remove any kind of late payment history. 
you can start removing or reducing the number of times that you run your credit or removing old um, hard inquiries because whole, hard inquiries are gonna fall off after about two years. So you can start taking a look at your credit reports and analyzing them yourself by knowing the factors, which is payment history, credit card utilization, total accounts, derogatory marks, credit age, and hard inquiries. And by looking at those five or six uh, factors, you can start to analyze and you can start to kind of chisel away and then eventually start rebuilding. So I want to take a second to transition a little bit too. And so when we talked a little bit earlier, we were talking a little bit about mortgages. And I think this is the time, right, where uh, the real estate market is starting to turn around a little bit. Um, I've heard sellers having issues selling their homes because buyers aren't getting approved. So talk to us a little bit about like, what does the approval process for getting a mortgage loan look like? Um, what does someone need to do to get pre-approved? And then talk to us about this concept of the depth of credit. Okay, so- It's a lot. <laughs> that's, that's a good question. Um, good number of questions. I will, so in my defense, I'm not a, I'm not a mortgage lender and I'm not a real, uh, realtor, um, but I have a number of them in my network. So I'll speak to my experience with them and how they have, how I have helped their clients. Um, and so the first thing most people think whenever they start to think about what do I need to do to get pre-approved? They start thinking about dollar signs, right? They start thinking about the 10%, the 20% down, all that kind of stuff. Do I need an FHA? Do I need a conventional? Can I even be considered for any of those? But even before all of that, I would honestly start looking at where your credit score is, but even deeper, I would start looking at what's on your credit because they're going to look at not just what that three digit score is, they're going to look at what's on it and what your history is. So if you have things like a bankruptcy or an eviction, those are going to be immediate red flags versus was this guy 30 days or 60 days late? Um, other things is the number of hard inquiries going back to that because it's even though it's a low impact factor it's so so important because it's a who's who of who you've talked about uh, who you've talked to about your credit and who you've tried to get lines of credit from can you can you give an example of that what can you give an example of hard inquiry and a soft inquiry for our viewers so they can really yeah. understand what that is yeah absolutely good question so a hard inquiry is think about if you go to um, Haverty's furniture store. That may be a local, a, lo a bit of a local uh, example, but just a uh, furniture store in general. And you see a, a bedroom set and you're like, man, that's a beautiful bedroom set, but it costs $2,500. Well, I, I don't want to spend, uh, spend $2,500 today, or I can't spend $2,500 today. And they say, well, would you like to finance? Well, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe. Well, let's let's see. Let's see if we can qualify you for a line of credit for twenty five hundred dollars. So they run your credit. And it comes back either approved or or, or um, either approved or not approved, uh, approved or denied. But in that transaction of running your credit, what they did was they went out to whatever vendors whatever credit bureaus that they use, whether it be Experian, Equifax, or TransUnion, and they said, hey, according to you, is this person, um, is this person qualified and worthy enough to be given this line of credit, to underwrite this line of credit for $2,500? And when they do that, they actually ding your credit. You, your credit actually increase, uh, decreases rather every single time that they run your credit on a hard inquiry. 
because what they're doing is they're going in and they're essentially reading your bi your credit biography and they're saying well maybe not them per se but the computer the computers are <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely not uh, different times but yes <laughs> <laughs> the computers are and they're saying is this guy worthy and do we think that he um has enough clout and enough reputation to um and is dependable enough to where we're going to get our $2,500 back. Um, so that's a hard inquiry. A soft inquiry is similar, but it's not going to ding your credit. And the hard inquiry is going to ding your credit anywhere from five to 10 points per hit. Now, when you think about this, when you go to an auto dealership, and you try and get pre-approved or get approved for an auto loan. Um, and some people listening may, may think about this and maybe may be like, yeah, I know exactly what he's talking about. They can ding your credit anywhere from 10 to 20 times because what they're doing on the front, they're saying, hey, I'm trying to get you the best possible deal or I'm trying to get you the best possible setup. But what they're doing is they're going through and they're making absolutely sure that this person is as dependable and trustworthy and reliable as those credit scores and those credit reports actually state. And so on the soft credit pool, it's going to be the same situation, but they're not going to have as much information come back. Um, but it's 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 a pretty decent indicator to what they're trying to figure out. So if it's a lower cost item that you're trying to finance um, or for a shorter term, then they may just do a soft pull. Yeah, you're referring to something like a, maybe like an insurance quote of some sort or, you know, some kind of background check, something like that to the fact employment verification. I mean, um, exactly. that's what you're referring to, right? Oh, awesome. Okay. And, and I want to get back because I think, and tell me if you, if you already kind of went over this, but what, what does the depth of credit mean to Because I want to make sure we get to that. Good, good question. Yes, I remember you did ask me that. So the depth of credit has to do with the age of each account. And what I mean by account is all of the lines of credit that you've ever taken out, successfully taken out. So that could be a mortgage, that could be an auto loan, that could be a student loan, that could be a revolving line of credit, credit card, um, that could be a personal loan. Um, in some instances, it may even be a business loan. But any type of underwriting that's ever been applied against your name, each of those are accounts. And the older that, the older an account is, and this kind of pertains more around revolving lines of credit rather than installment lines of credit because installment lines of credit have a due date. Once you pay that off, it's gonna close. So revolving lines of credit like credit cards, as long as you continue to pay them on time and keep them in good standing, they're gonna age month by month and then eventually year by year and eventually decade by decade. And the older, that your oldest account is to your youngest account is and the average number of what that what those are that's going to be your account age and the older your account age is the deeper your credit is going to be okay very cool yeah that's a concept that that i'm sure our, our listeners are getting a lot from i definitely learned from that so i want to move forward a little bit and start to get to some of the educational work that you do. Um, so first off, yeah, tell us a little bit about like what you're teaching about around credit and like what, what the point of some of what you're doing there is. Yeah, great, great question. Again, um, this, is, this has been an amazing conversation. I, I love having conversations like this, um, especially when it's received from both sides, right? You can learn something from, from both sides. Um, and so what I'm doing um, back in 2019, after I, after I got my 
personal credit fixed and I started building it up and I started figuring out and learning what I didn't know, um, I actually jumped on board and partnered with a nonprofit called United Credit Education Services. And what they do is um, they're a 5013C. They actually have built this online platform that provides services that educate all facets and all capacities of financial literacy, everything from budgeting to saving to actually protecting um, credit monitoring, identity monitoring, building a will and trust, everything in between. So that not, not only because the mindset behind the way that we approach it is we would rather teach a person how to fish than give them a, a mill for one day, right? Because if we just go out there and we clean the slate and we consolidate all the loans and we, you know, do bankruptcy and start you off from zero, well, yeah, uh, you know, once you go in and, and get that first secured card and you start building it back up, it's going to jump up really quickly. And if we just go in and give you an 800 credit score, guess what? In six to eight months, you're going to be exactly where you were because you don't have the knowledge, you don't have the foundation. And so by teaching you what you don't know and by teaching you the processes, you're less likely to make those same mistakes. Or if you do happen to fall into a pitfall again, you can identify it and you can know how to, how to, how to pull yourself back out. So that's really what we've been try, trying to achieve is giving that knowledge and putting that knowledge in the hands of people and empowering them so that as they go through um, their day-to-day -day lives, they have that. And trust me, I, I'm not perfect. I don't, I'll admit it, you know, here on the air, I don't have an 850 credit score, but I have that knowledge. And as long as I have that knowledge, I can correct the mistakes. Um, and so, you know, as people are going through and as I'm going through, I'm building and depthening that, that discipline. And that's really where it strives from. I, I want to talk about this for a second too, because I love this. I love that you said that. And we're going to ask so many more of our guests to tell us more about like their current situation. I was talking to a good friend about this and I thought it was really cool. This idea of like, okay, we're going to talk to you right now. We're going to talk to you. We're going to know that you don't have that 850 credit score. All right. <laughs> but we know what you know. And we know what you're going to be doing for the next six months, the next 12 months, right? And then you're going to come back and you're going to tell us about how it was what you've been doing since you told us that got you to that 850 credit score. Because one of the biggest things around this, this concept of financial literacy has to do with patience and has to do with being, being consistent about what you're doing and just waiting until you get to the point where you're actually going to receive you know, what it is that you've been already focused on. And, and it's something that at the very beginning is tough, right? So if you're going through that, it's okay. Because what happens is over time, you really get drilled into the, like, you don't care about the day-to-day -day results because you know that it's just going to be that, that day when it does happen, right? You're going to be, you're going to have to have the tools and rather the, the, page, the, the skill sets that will allow you to continue to get even further and further and further. So love that. Thank you for the honesty. You're very well. and, and Fabian, you had you something you wanted to go in on? Yeah, I actually wanted to talk about something, man. I, I think, um, Jordan, talk to us about um, net worth. Like, what, why, why would somebody care? Why would the, the most normal of individuals, the everyday individual, care about net worth and that, that concept of net worth? Yeah, that's, that's an important one. Um, you know, we, we see all the time on TV, on the internet, listen to on the radio, you know, this actor's net worth increased by a hundred million dollars last year, or this actor or actress's, um, you know, uh, net worth decreased because they filed bankruptcy or whatever. But we don't oftentimes think about our own net worth. And I think that that, if we thought of a little bit more about what we're worth, 
And I'm not even, I'll take a step out and say, it's not even about the financial numbers. It's about the, the inner confidence and the inner um, perception of ourselves. If we thought about that a little bit more, that a lot more people would be a lot more successful. Um, but going back to, to net worth, essentially it goes back to budgeting. It goes back to what's coming in versus what's going out, your, your income versus your expenses, your, um, your assets versus your liabilities. It's all a balancing act. And if you can grow your assets as high as possible while pushing down your liabilities and eliminating them as much as possible, that right there is... You know, I, I keep hearing um, through all of these channels about money and, you know, there's there's a lot of different perceptions around. You've got this crowd over here going, I've got to make as much money as I can to be happy. And then you've got this crowd over here going, money is the root of all evil and you you shouldn't base your life on it. And I think the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Because like I said at the beginning, it's just a tool, but it's a tool that can not only help you get where you need to go, but it's a tool that can you can help others get where they need to go as well. And so that net worth, I think that is to, I think net worth is an outward perception of, of, of your financial education. Um, you know, if someone, if you look at someone now, I understand there's some outliers. Um, there's some people out there that hit the lottery or there's some people out there that, you know, made the latest app and, you know, made it and hit it big and whatnot. But when you look at your net worth and if it's in the negatives, I can promise you that your budget and your bank account look similar, but on the flip side, if your bank account or if your net worth is in the positives in the big positives, then your budget and your, your bank account are going to be similar as well too. I wanted to follow up to um, financial protection, right? We've always heard about the way of financial protection in terms of, Hey, a credit card company is going to call us just in case they see anything fraudulent or anything questionable. But what are some other concepts of finan financial protection do you teach? Or you kind of spread the word out? Yeah. So we teach about obviously credit protection and protecting your credit. I mean, no one, you know, no hackers out there are trying to steal someone's credit score that has a 480, you know, or a 450. Um, but as you're building that, that financial literacy and your scores going up, 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 you're going to become more of a target, you know, that, that bullseye on your back is going to grow bigger and bigger, both offline and online, probably even more so on the latter. And so what we teach is not just how to use credit responsibly, but also how to use it wisely, you know, how to pick out, um, a, um, a dependable website versus, uh, you know, something that may be a little bit more shady. Um, how to, you know, look at, you know, when you're, when you're at a gas station, use, use a credit card versus a debit card, little tips and tricks like that, that's going to protect you. But in addition to credit protection, we also protect, uh, we also teach identity theft protection, because again, when you're online, even outside of your financials, you're always susceptible to some kind of either uh, stealing of your social security card or social security number, um, stealing of your, your picture, what you look like, your likeness, um, anything about you can potentially be used, um, against you or, you know, um, in place of you. And so having that awareness and that conscientiousness, um, is, goes a long way to, to protecting your bank account. Amazing. And so I want to ask just to, to go back a little bit to some of your personal situation that you've dealt with 
you know, a lot of young people, they're going to school, they're going into massive amounts of debt. And I think sometimes it's a bit scary and it's a bit unfair um, because you're really young when you're 18 years old and you're making this decision to go to school and you're trying to figure out exactly what it is that you're doing with your life. And right now we're seeing a lot of people graduate and have no idea what they're supposed to do with their uh, you know, bachelor's degree. And then they're going back to school, getting into further debt. So tell us a little bit about like, what, what do you feel like you kind of experienced around like your age and debt? And then like, how, how young do you think people should be when they start learning about this stuff to prevent some of those types of potential issues around debt and whatnot? Yeah, yeah, that's, man, if I had only known, right? <laughs> um, so most people don't know this about me or most people that in the professional world don't know this about me, but I actually, after I got my high school degree, I actually went to school for architecture. That was, that was what I originally went to college for. And um, it, it was one of those things, I'm still very passionate about design, but these days I'm more passionate about helping people design their life versus maybe designing a building. Um, but going through school, um, yeah, I didn't know what I didn't know. And so literally I was just trying to survive. But if I were to have taken a step back and said, you know, what, what is really important to having to survive versus surviving almost in a more luxurious way, you know, like I could have easily gone to Walmart and some days I did whenever I was running low on money, I could have easily gone to Walmart or gone to the gas station and purchased some less expensive meals versus going out to Mexican or going out to a steakhouse, you know, um, two or three times a month, something like that. Um, but on the flip side, um, you know, just knowing what I wanted to achieve and knowing what kind of lifestyle I wanted to end up in and backing my way into that, um, I think I had the right idea by going into architectural school because I knew that that industry was going to be lucrative once I, once I graduated. But knowing what it was going to take and a lot of this stuff, we don't know what we don't know, right? So that's that's part of life. Um, but these days in the information age, we can get a lot more than than I could have back then. And so, you know, being able to design your life at the forefront as much as possible will help you a long way to, you know, cutting out those unnecessary expenses or unnecessary debt. Um, what was the, there was a second part to the question that you asked. Yeah, just like how, how old do you think it is or how, how old do you think oh. people should be when they start learning about this? Right, yes, thank you, thank you. So part of, this is, this is actually pretty cool. Part of what we teach in that program is that you can actually, and it's actually recommended that parents start teaching their kids about currency, about money, and about its value as early as the age of two. Oh, two. Oh, two years old. Wow. I love it. Interesting. <laughs> because think about it. Think about it. If, if you have an 18 year old and you give them a check for 25 or cash for 20 worth $25,000, what do you think the first thing they're going to do with it is? Mm. They're going to spend like, that. If yeah, you shit. start spend at the it all. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> where, not the gonna where the Jays at? Where the, where the food at? <laughs> <laughs> where the nearest nice club truck. at? Nice truck. I know I'm in Georgia. Out in Georgia, you might buy a truck. I'm from Tennessee. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, yes. Exactly. But if you start at the age of two or around about, so let's say three, four, five, somewhere in that neighborhood, and you start saying, okay, I'm going to give you an allowance if you go and do this, or I'm going to start charging you interest 
at the age of seven, or if you know if you go out and you do this this many times, you can scale up. You know, teaching them these concepts so that whenever they are in their late teens, early twenties, that shock factor is it, it. It may be still there a little bit, but they're going to know a lot more. Um, and they're going to know how, I won't even say how to responsibly use it. I would, I would almost say they're going to be more inclined to know how to most optimally use it. I just, like I just want to really quickly tap in because that shock factor, I think is such an important thing. And the younger you can get someone to have that shock factor, because I feel like no matter who you are, what you're going through, everyone gets to the point to where a certain amount of money is a lot to them. Right. And being responsible about that is just something that you just have to learn, like through experience. Right. So that was something that's super interesting to think about. You know, the sooner that you can get someone to experience that, right, could even just be such a different, def, you know, a definer of how successful someone can be financially or, or literate someone can be. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I like that, man. I mean, definitely the first thing I think what came to first thing that came to mind when you were talking a little while ago was this quote, uh, you know, those who fail to plan, pl plan to fail. You know what I mean? No matter how it goes in terms of any aspirations or anything of that nature, when it comes down to financial statuses, you want to go ahead and plan to save or invest or improve credit in any kind of way. Um, I think it's just wonderful. Uh, this was awesome. Keith, how you feeling? Is it time? Jordan, how, how you feeling? <laughs> I think it's about that time. It's that rapid round. <laughs> <laughs> how you feeling, y'all? Let's do it. Yeah, man. So we're going to go through a rapid round. We just want to ask you some quick questions. Get your, your first response that comes into your head. Uh, first question, tell me, please, Jordan. What are some sources... Uh, of information that people can go to to learn more about this topic? Ooh, good question. Um, I might get hit over the side of the head later on, but I'm going to say creditkarma.com. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know they've recently got a bad rap. It's bad timing, I know, but they have a wealth of information on there. Um, if, you, if you look at it the right way, if you use it the right way, I think it can really, really help out a lot of people. Love it. Love it, man. Tell us, what is your favorite book? It does not have to be financially related. What's your favorite book? Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And who's that by? Robert Kiyosaki. For those who don't know. And um, okay, so do you have a favorite podcast that you like to listen to? Ooh. I, I'll be honest with you, man. Um, I've only recently started getting into like Audible and audiobooks. Um, I haven't really dug too deep into podcasts, um, but I will say most recently, uh, I recently just joined a BNI chapter um, in my local community, and that's a, another conversation for another day, but essentially it's a referral marketing uh, group, and they have a podcast that is all about building business, and, and some of it is financially related, um, so it is pretty relevant to this conversation. But um, I think they have like four or 500 episodes. And so awesome. that's, that's what I've been diving into lately. So. Oh, yeah. Amazing. I know. I know Cash Rules podcast is definitely up there as well. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I'm thinking <laughs> to do. I've got some homework after this for sure. <laughs> <laughs> new and new to add to the list. Amazing. Jordan, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you for joining yeah. us. Um, please. So before, before you head out, we definitely want to know, because people are going to be interested, man, where can they reach you after this? Absolutely, man. So um, my website is www.dreamlifeinnovations.com. Um, they can also look me up. Um, I've got a business page and a personal page on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and Twitter. Um I'm, I'm just breaking into like the whole TikTok and reels and all that kind of stuff. But um, those are the big ones. It's uh, Facebook and Instagram. And then of course my, my website. So. 
Cool, man. Thanks again. This has been dope. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me, man. This was awesome. I, I appreciate you. This this was astounding. I told I told y'all, didn't I tell y'all he was gonna bring some knowledge and information? He's gonna <laughs> oh my I felt I felt uh, I feel like I'm a financial expert now. I feel like I got an 800 <laughs> credit score. I'm ready to buy a house or something. <laughs> Jordan, it was a wonderful, wonderful interview, man. I appreciate your time and energy, man. You brought you brought everything we was expecting and more. Um, Keith, yeah, Jordan, thank you very much, man. How you yep. feeling, Keith? You good to go? incredible man even more so and i just want to thank you all for joining us this has been another episode of cash rules and we're going to see you next time so subscribe follow you know what to do dollar dollar bills y'all peace out <laughs> Stop.